Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, this is part two of a series we're doing now. The title is Heaven, All Your Questions Answered. And the source of our uh, study, first and foremost, are the scriptures. Uh, but we're also using a book uh, titled Heaven. It's, it's by... Uh, Randy Alcorn. So we're working our way through his book. If you don't have this book, uh, you can probably get it at Walmart or Target now for uh, you know three or four dollars. It's been in print for several years. Uh, you can also download it free, I think, on some PDF file that uh, so someone told me is available. But uh, yeah, I really recommend this book. And uh, to recap uh, what we covered last time, basically. Uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about uh, heaven that we'll be learning about in this book. One of the most surprising things that we, we've talked about is that uh, there's very few uh, books written and very few sermons taught on the subject of heaven. <laughs> it's, it's amazing that pastors want to write about and preach about from their pulpits about everything else and neglect what should be the most wonderful topic that we should be thinking about all the time, and that is our eternal destiny and our, our uh, eternal life. What will we be doing? What will it be like? So we're going to be uh, talking about this for quite a few episodes. I think if an episode is two hours, this may very well take us 10 or 20 episodes to get through this subject. It's, uh, there's a lot to be said about heaven. So we'll pick up where we left off last time, but first let me introduce the panelists. We'll start off with uh, Brother Mitch. Hi. Hello, Brother Mitch. I like to go to heaven just like everyone else. <laughs> yeah, you think you're going to go there, Brother? I don't know. I'm a pretty bad sinner, but somebody told me that guy got a loophole. So <laughs> yeah. I get in there that way, yeah. Yeah, I heard a rumor that you received a free gift from Jesus, and it's eternal life in heaven. Did you receive it? Uh, I, I was checking the mail the other day, and uh... <laughs> okay, Brother Mitch's channel is uh, Mitchell Belenkoff, so uh, please subscribe to his channel on YouTube. Uh, next, next we got uh, Brother Jackson. Hey everyone, it's Jackson here, and my YouTube channel is Mecha Wing Zero. Okay, and please subscribe to Jackson's channel. Uh, he's just recently started making videos, and he's got it off, gotten off to a great start. His first few videos, I, I give him A pluses on it. So, really, uh, check him out. Uh, next, next we have uh, Brother Eric. Hi, everybody. Brother Eric. Uh, my YouTube channel is Jesus Night Seventy Two. Um, glad to be here as always for this fellowship tonight. Okay, thank you, brother. Uh, and, and next we have uh, Brother Austin, if he's back. He's with us. He had hey, to step Luke, away. Brother Luke, I'm here, I'm here. Okay, say hi to everybody. Hey, how's everybody doing? My name's Austin. My channel name's uh, Austin Bell. I run an online ministry called Christ Ministries. Uh, glad to hear. Can't wait to do this series. It sounds like an excellent series. Uh, it's good. About time people start talking about the good stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay, for the whole panel, thank you for being here. Um, let me see, uh, who was here last time besides Eric? I was. Okay. All right, so I'd like you guys to give like a, a brief recap of what we covered up to this point, what stands out in your mind so far. Uh, first, Brother Eric, just in like one minute, kind of sum up what, you, what sticks in your mind that we talked about last time. Well, um, you kind of briefly touched on this, but it was the general um, lack of discussion that there is about heaven these days, and how it's um, to some people in the uh, in in the Christian community, uh, even people who claim to be pastors, you know, had made comments uh, that uh, heaven, as they understood it, was a boring place, and that they that they weren't necessarily looking forward to it. Uh, very strange ideas based, you know, completely unbiblical based ideas coming from people who are supposedly church leadership, which is kind of alarming. Yeah, that's that's true. It's 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 amazing how one how little talk about it, uh, and then two how uh, uh, the typical person's um, uh, thoughts about heaven are not really they're not excited about it. They think it's going to be some kind of boring place. Uh, brother, brother Austin. Yeah, I was just going to say, brother Jackson was uh, here also. 
But uh, yeah, it's, it was. Uh, we first touched based on you know the initial process and uh, the wonderful beauty of. Uh, I think he was touching on grace salvation. You know uh, the uh, the author uh, Acorn or Acorn. He was a wonderful uh, free gracer. It's an excellent author, and the the book was wonderful. He was explaining. You know, it's not grace unless it's grace, and uh, we did, we're we're first uh, touching on the wonderful joys and the unknown wonders that we'll experience, and uh, the things that most people outrule because they think, oh, it's heaven, I can't be there. But you know, it's it's a wonderful experience that most people aren't prepared for. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, I guess those are the main points we've covered so far. One is that uh, uh, there's one way to get to heaven. And, and, and you can't get to heaven by joining re the religions of the world and becoming a religious person. You can't work your way to heaven and earn it. It's a, it's a, it's a free gift that God offers everyone who believes in Jesus Christ as their Savior. When we put our faith completely in Jesus, he gives us eternal life uh, in the kingdom of God and we'll live uh, with him forever in heaven. So um, that's the first thing. You've got to know how to get there and you must trust Jesus. And then once you get there, what's it going to be like? Well, it's not going to be a boring place. It's going to be exciting. And as we go through this book, you'll find out pretty much all the questions you've ever wondered about heaven will be answered. Uh, but we're at the point in the book now where I want to read a point and then get everybody's feedback here. It says, um, it bears repeating because it is so commonly misunderstood. When we die, believers in Christ will not go to the heaven where we'll live forever. Instead, we'll go to an intermediate heaven. In the intermediate heaven, we'll wait, await the time of Christ's return to the earth, our bodily resurrection, the final judgment, and the creation of the new heavens and new earth. If we fail to grasp this truth, we will fail to understand the biblical doctrine of heaven. So, is there anybody uh, on the panel that's surprised to I the, uh, the idea of an intermediate heaven uh, that's kind of a temporary heaven before we get to the ultimate uh, eternal heaven? Is it, is it a surprise to anybody on the panel? Hmm. Yeah. Okay, so everybody's yeah. familiar with that, and we all we are we're all in agreement on that as a as a basic doctrine. Uh, it may surprise some people. I actually grew up hearing that. Unlike me, probably most people, you did. Yeah, that it was intermediate. Well, I, I, if a person studied the Bible much, I mean, obviously you'd have to come to that conclusion. But uh, I don't think I've ever heard that taught from the pulpit from anyone. Uh, do, you, do you think the the Christian uh, world as a whole is familiar with this idea? Likely not. I, I don't think it's a case of that they're. I agree with all, I agree with uh, Jackson, but at the same time, I think that there's another part of his because they stop at they don't get into certain details. That's why people don't go so far as to contemplate that it's an intermediary heaven. I think that I think because what we talked about that very reason that it's stopped and there's no detail put into this. That's why people don't may not understand or 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 or, or feel that there that concept exists there, but it is. Okay. Um, I'll read it a little further. It says, It may seem strange to say that the heaven we go to at death isn't eternal. Yet it's true. Quote, Christians often talk about living with God in heaven forever, unquote, writes theologian Wayne Gruden. Uh, but in fact, the biblical teaching is richer than that. It tells us that there will be new heavens and a new earth an entirely renewed creation, and we will live with God there. There will also be a new kind of unification of heaven and earth. There will be a joining of heaven and earth in this new creation. So, uh, I mean, we have all studied this enough to, to be familiar with this idea, but again, what do you think that... Uh, that I think if you talk to uh, your typical person who is just a Christian who hasn't studied this and learned about these things, they might be very surprised to hear this. What do you get? What do you think, Mitch? Well, I mean, just looking at the the words that Jesus spoke today, you'll be with me in paradise. The paradise, the the heavens and the earth have not been have not been rolled up yet. 
we hasn't been renewed yet. So just looking at, 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 you know, today you're going to be with me in paradise, and paradise hasn't happened yet. You put two and two together, and you come up with this, you know, um, that, that it has to be, that, that there has to be an intermediary place before there is the, the new heavens and the new earth were created. Mm -hmm. Okay, it says, the heaven we will go to when we die, he calls it the, the intermediate heaven, is a temporary dwelling place, a stop along the way to our final destination, the new earth. The new earth. What do you do? You, do you think Christians as a whole have any idea that in eternity they're going to be living on Earth? I think I think when Christians do, um, one of the problems is um, in a lot of churches um, the study of things like uh, eschatology, uh, what the Old Testament books speak of as far as prophecy and the Book of Revelation. Um, it's almost in a, in a large number of churches. It's looked at as too symbolic, too complicated, and it's not something that you should really bother even getting into. And so, when you eliminate those books and you eliminate where it discusses that, you really don't have any other place to go. And it, it gives people also a very limited idea of what resurrection really means, and that God is a God of resurrection, not just a resurrection for us, but a resurrection for His creation, a resurrection for the world as we know it, for the universe as we know it. This is not the way it was intended to be. God being a God of restoration and resurrection, I think you see the picture of this all through the Old Testament, all the way through to Revelation. He's He's cluing you in. He's showing you that He intends to resurrect not only us but all of His creation. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah, the um, well, for for us on the panel, uh, everybody on the panel has done a, a lot of Bible study. So uh, this idea is uh, is not new to any of us. Uh, but for anybody watching this video, not only this idea, but as we go through this study over the next probably several months. You're going to find out there's all kinds of new th new ideas that will kind of shock you and surprise you. But everything we're going to talk about uh, is in the Bible. The scriptures say these things, and we'll as we go through this, we'll show you the scriptures that uh, that uh, cause us to have these conclusions. Okay, another analogy is more precise but difficult to imagine because for most of us, it's outside our experience. Imagine leaving the homeless shelter in Miami and flying to the intermediate location, Dallas, and then turning around and going back home to your place of origin, which has been completely renovated, a new Miami. In this new Miami, you would no longer live in a homeless shelter, but in a beautiful house in a glorious, pollution-free, crime-free, sin-free city. You would end up living not in a new home, but a radically improved version of your old home. <laughs> so the uh, the idea of a a new earth that's as you, Eric said is is uh, restored, renewed. Uh, in, all of creation is going to be remade, uh, and, and it's going to be far better than uh, the earth as we knew it before. But it will be Earth, and we will recognize much about it. It's not Does going that to mean there'll be cool. physical matter there? What's that? Does that mean there'll be physical matter there and everything? Absolutely. Yes, yes. Uh, the, the, the thing that's interesting about that is I wonder how some of that's going to work scientifically, because one of the results of having matter and everything is death and all that stuff and things wearing out and stuff. But, so but, if you, but, if you, but Jackson, even in our, and this is interesting, I'm glad you mentioned that because you brought, you made me think of something I wanted to mention here. This actually speaks to uh, the way God built things to begin with. Um, basic ideas of physics is that matter is not truly created or destroyed as we know it. It's it's just changes forms. So when if, even if I were to be standing under an atomic blast you know, and, and I'm incinerated, I'm really not gone. The particles of me are just so infinitely small that you just don't see them anymore and they're spread out over a vast area but I'm still not gone do you know what I mean so it's I, I believe things <coughs> be, they're intended to be that way and 
they'll be the same things that we knew and yet different. It'll be like you'll be able to almost rediscover new things about things that you already experienced. It's going to be a very interesting uh, time, I think. Yeah, I, I think... Go to space? What's that? Will we be able to go to space? Um, well, I, I think we're going to cover that in some future chapter. There's probably a point where we're going to be talking about the universe and what we'll be doing throughout eternity. But for now, this, this new Earth, uh, we will recognize it as Earth. It's not going to be foreign to us like, uh, oh, we... You mean this was Earth? No. It's just that it'll be like Earth on steroids. It'll just be like super Earth. The best the best. It'll be like San Diego. <laughs> San Diego. San Diego? Mitch loves San Diego. Since he moved there from New Jersey, he thinks it's kind of paradise on Earth. Oh, because that was the paradise on Earth. I, I, I just picture techno music and drive-in movie theaters playing monster movies. <laughs> Okay, uh, it says, this is what the Bible promises us. We will live with Christ and each other forever, not in the intermediate heaven, but on the new earth where God will be at home with his people. So, uh, we're going as we go through this, we'll find that there is this new heavens and new earth that we will spend eternity in, but until that happens, the people are who are already uh, deceased, who but have, uh, have their saving relationship with Jesus, these people are in this intermediate temporary heaven until, and that's where, if I died tonight, that's where I would go to the temporary intermediate heaven, until God re uh, re recreates the entire universe and gives me the, give us the new heavens and the new earth. Um, and it says that God's going to dwell there. Does that sound familiar to anybody? God's going to dwell there with his people. Yes. Yeah. The mercy, will the mercy seat be there? Will the mercy seat be on earth? Well, I think that uh, the, in the New Jerusalem, it has uh, uh, the throne of God, and I'm not sure there will be any need for a mercy seat any longer, but uh, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, I thought it just stays. I, like, Isn't it true that uh, Christ will always have the scars? Well, I, I don't know if it says that, if, if we can assume that throughout eternity or not, uh, but I guess maybe we'll come to that at some point in the book where it will discuss that. Okay. Uh, I've read this entire book, but it's been about uh, you know, <laughs> seven, eight years since I read the book, uh, so I, I don't know if we'll go through that any, in any more detail, but I can't answer the question right off the top of my head. That's fine. I just wondered because I know in a lot of movies they always show them with the scars, but I guess after everything's already done with, I mean... I, okay. I would see why you would keep well, him to show his love for us, but at the same time, if they weren't there anymore, I could understand that too. I, I think one of the reasons they get that is because um, is when Christ, uh, after he was resurrected and he returned, you know, he he clearly shows, you know, when when, uh, when Thomas was doubting him and he shows him his hands and his feet and his side, so he he clearly bore the wounds after he was resurrected. So I, I'm not, I, I think that's where people get that from. It may be the case, it may not. It's actually good that you're asking these questions, Austin, because it might be something that, like Luke was saying, that through the process of the book. We go through because I haven't finished it completely. You may find some of these eight questions getting answered. You might want to write them down and uh, and see if we come across something that might, you know, might allude to that. Yeah. So God, uh, when did God live with man on Earth before? Oh, uh, Garden of Eden. Uh, before before man's fall. Yeah. So the idea of God and man living together on Earth is not really some new strange idea. That was God's idea from the beginning. That's right. And then what happened? The fall. Well, the, the betrayal. The serpent uh, fooled, uh, beguiled Eve. But no, you could have stopped. You could have stopped there. The fall. It was man's failure, whether Satan tempted him or not. It was man's failure. So, um, it was the fall that stopped that. Yeah. So yeah. And that caused that caused death to come into the world. All of creation okay. was spoiled. Uh, man inherited uh, death. Uh, there's a death sentence in all men, so that's why we need to put our faith in Jesus so we can receive eternal life from him. That's why all of creation is spoiled today. It's The earth is not as spectacular and wonderful as it was because now death reigns through the earth, and uh, God's going to create it all, all over again and make it perfect, maybe I, as I, it was, maybe it was as it was originally or maybe even better than it was originally. 
I did have one thing, bro, Luke, real fast, is on this. Uh, it was that, you know, everything for the wages of sin is death. Everybody has to die because of sin. Now, my, my question is, because of the sin nature, is it because all living things will die? Is that because man has been involved or somehow, you know, had interactions with other, you know, non-living things or living things that they die too? Because like trees, like a tree didn't sin, but it's going to die, or like an animal, an animal didn't sin, but that's going to die. Now my question is, did mankind somehow, uh, you know, have do interactions or something where the sin nature kind of rubbed off on them, or is just because the it's Earth a controversial uh, question, Austin? Okay. This gets into whether or not you think that death of animals and stuff was before the fall or not. Many claim that there wasn't. Some, like me, disagree, but. Okay. I think the only thing that comes to my mind is that uh, it says through one man, Adam, death entered the world. Right. So uh, it, I don't think it, it really is explicit uh, other than that one statement talking about how death came into the world. So um, now it says because God created heaven, it had a beginning and is therefore neither timeless nor changeless. It had a past the time prior to Christ's incarnation, death and resurrection. It has a present, the intermediate heaven where believers go when they die. And it will have a future, the eternal heaven or new earth. The past heaven, the intermediate heaven, and the eternal heaven can all be called heaven. Yet they are not synonymous. Okay, so is that clear to everybody, these three things that we can call heaven, and they can legitimately be called heaven, and yet they're not synonymous, they're not the same. Yes. Are you saying that the new earth is can also be called heaven? If not, what is the third? I know about the skies and everything, and I know about where we go currently, like if I were to die right now, where I would go. Well, we know that in the eternity, that the, we'll be going into this much more detail later, but in eternity, uh, heaven and earth will be united. Right. So, so the new heaven and new earth uh, could be used interchangeably. Heaven will be on earth. And then you have the heavens, which is all of God's creation is the heavens. Yeah, well, so, so there might in, in, end, up, in, end up being a little bit of truth in that 80s song, Heaven is a Place on Earth. Mm -hmm. Well, it will be a place on Earth. <laughs> it will be a place with her. <laughs> yeah, that is, will be. You okay, know that's so, what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Right. San Diego. You, you so, know what so, that's worth. My question is, uh, uh, what are these three heavens that he's referred to here? The, the new Earth. Heaven combined with the uh, with um with the heaven, and then the uh, the heavens being the skies and the stars and outer right. space and all that right. stuff, and then the, and then where we go, like where a Christian goes currently, like if I were to die right now at this minute, where I would go, right, where God well, dwells at this very place. Well, uh, I I was asking the question uh, in respect to Randy Alcorn's point he just made, not, not into the terms of, in the Bible it f refers to the three heavens. The, 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 there's the heavens is the universe and the earth is in this heaven. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the atmosphere around the earth is called the heavens. That's just where the, the, the birds fly and, and the demons have, are the, are the spirits, uh, Lucifer is the, the God right. of that world over the atmosphere around the earth. Right. And then we, we have the heaven where we refer to where God's throne is. Mm -hmm. So those are the three heavens that we know of in the scriptures. But, but Randy Elkhorn's talking about the past, present, and future heavens. Mm -hmm. The past heaven is before the crucifixion. That's where, that's where the saved people would go, uh, but they couldn't go to this intermediate heaven yet because they had to wait in this place called paradise until right. Jesus paid for their sins. And then Jesus went into paradise and took them up to this intermediate heaven. Now when, when believers die, they go right to that intermediate heaven, which is the present heaven. And then there's going to kind of come a point where God uh, recreates the heavens and the earth into this eternal state. 
the new heavens and the new earth, and that's where we'll be living on the earth, uh, and that's where we're going to be talking. But right now, the subject of the book is this intermediate heaven. What will it be like? Okay. Uh, the great redemptive promises of God will find their ultimate fulfillment on the new earth, not in the intermediate heaven. So it's the new earth that someone asked the question, is, is, is heaven going to be on earth? Yeah, it's, that will be our eternal existence on the new earth, and God will bring this, what's called New Jerusalem, his throne, right to the earth, and God will live on the earth with uh, his uh, children, which is the children of God, the, uh, the saved. Okay, uh, now the distinguishing the present and future heavens. It says, question, what is heaven like, and what will heaven be like? Have two different answers. The present intermediate heaven is in the angelic realm distinctly separate from Earth, though, as we'll see, likely have more physical qualities than we might assume. By contrast, the future heaven will be in the human realm on Earth. The dwelling place of God will be the dwelling place of humanity in a resurrected universe. Quote, Then I saw a new heaven and a new Earth, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. That's Revelation 21, verses 1 through 3. Heaven, God's dwelling place, will one day be on the new earth. Okay? So... As I said, uh, Randy Elkhorn has a lot of interesting ideas in this book, uh, but I think he shows scriptures to, to back up each of his points. Even though, as we go through this uh, as a panel, we might not necessarily agree with every one of his conclusions completely, but he does have scriptures to make his point. So here he cites Revelation 21, 1 through 3 to show that uh, God will live with man on earth, He's going to bring heaven down and unite it with earth. And so that will be our eternal heaven. But for a while, we're going to be talking more about this temporary intermediate heaven. So uh, if anybody, if I jump from one point to the next and someone wants to say something, just uh, there's a lot of ground to cover. But go ahead and if you want to respond to anything I said so far. I, I did have a question. Yeah. On the new earth, will we be uh, commingled with angels? Will angels be with us? I think that's going to be one of the questions he answers further on in the book. So that, that's one of those things that we're going to yeah. kind of cover you're, you're piece jumping, by piece. You're, you're probably jumping about four or five chapters ahead because right now we're going to be talking about this temporary intermediate heaven. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Okay, now some would argue that the new earth shouldn't be called heaven. But it seems clear to me that if God's special dwelling place is by definition heaven, and we're told that, quote, the dwelling of God will be with mankind on earth, then heaven and the new earth will be essentially the same place. We're told that, quote, the throne of God and of the Lamb, quote, unquote, is in the new Jerusalem, which is brought down uh, to the new earth, that's Revelation 22.1, Again, it seems clear that wherever God dwells with his people and sits on his throne would be called heaven. Okay, so now that's Randy Alcorn's um, kind of conclusion. He's putting two and two together. Now, is there anybody who thinks that that's an unwarranted conclusion to, to be able to call uh, the, 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 new he the new earth heaven because God lives there with us and God's throne in the new Jerusalem will be on the earth? Is that is that a leap, or do you agree with his conclusion? I think it makes perfect sense. <laughs> okay, no dissenters there, huh? Okay. Uh, I concur with theologian Anthony Hokima, who writes, quote, The New Jerusalem does not remain in a heaven far off in space, but it comes down to the renewed earth where the redeemed will spend eternity in resurrection bodies. So heaven and earth, now separated, 
will then be merged. The new earth will also be heaven, since God will dwell there with his people. Glorified believers, in other words, will continue to be in heaven while they are inhabiting the new earth. So if... Uh, uh, if, if, if you... Uh, disagree with any of his conclusions as we go through here, feel free to, uh, to say, well, I think he's uh, gone a little too far with that conclusion, or I would have stated a little bit differently. But unless you dissent, I'm assuming that everybody agrees with Randy Alcorn's conclusion that in eternity, Earth will be heaven. Yes. Yeah. Yes. As, as far as the scriptures are concerned, that he's that, they, that he's quoted, it all seems to fall into line. Yeah. And uh, I mean, and also just a logical conclusion. If God, if heaven is where God dwells, and then in the future God will dwell on earth with us, then, uh, then logically we'd have to say that that is heaven where he's dwelling here on earth. Exactly. As, as, the, as, the, scripture, as the scriptures that he used yeah. uh, 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 points out. Yeah, uh, and I think everybody's going to agree that uh, as we go through this, I was very impressed when I read this book uh, years ago that he, there was not like kind of like real liberal loose uh, speculation from him. Uh, all of his conclusions, he cites scriptures to show you where he came to the conclusion and how he kind of put two and two together to come with a conclusion. And as I said, uh, looking back on it, I don't remember if I disagree with any of his conclusions, but... I don't know if, as we go through this, if we will all agree 100% on this. Now, he says, several books on heaven state that the new Jerusalem will not descend to earth, but will remain, quote, suspended over the earth, unquote. But Revelation 21.2 doesn't say this. When John watches the city, quote, coming down, unquote, from heaven, there's no reason to believe it stops before reaching the new earth. The assumption that it remains suspended over the earth arises from the notion that heaven and earth must always be separate. But scripture indicates they will be joined. Their present incompatibility is due to a temporary aberration. Earth is under sin and the curse. Once that aberration is corrected, heaven and earth will be fully compatible again. See Ephesians 1.10. So let's look up Revelation 21.2 and Ephesians 1.10 and see what they say. Whoever finds them first, read it. Oh, I knew that I was coming. Some sleep now. Oh. <laughs> I got Ephesians one ten for you. Okay, um, Ephesians one ten states that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Okay. So Randy Elkhorn is using that verse as a proof text that that the earth and heaven will be compatible at that time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does anybody see any problem with that? No. Okay. Now, what about the earth being suspended? I mean, heaven being suspended above the earth. This new Jerusalem comes down. Uh, let's, does anybody have tw Revelation twenty-one two? You guys own Bibles. Here you go. It's Revelation twenty-one two. I don't know where mine went. <laughs> and I, I got it. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Okay. Now, do you understand this point he's making here? He said there are some authors who take that as a, um, uh, they conclude that this new Jerusalem comes down, but it never actually connects to earth. But Randy Elkhorn is making the point that why should we assume that it, it stops and doesn't come to the earth? Why should we conclude that? 
Well, actually, from, Reve from Revelation 21-2 that we just read, I think that flies in the face of that, because the statement that's made there, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, implies that there is a union about to happen, a union between the bride and her husband. So she's prepared coming down, and he sees it. He sees it prepared just as we are prepared in Christ prior to our union with our raptured bodies. We're being prepared as a bride. We are the bride of Christ, the church. Um, we're being prepared for what? For that union, that time we come together with Christ and the time where we receive our resurrected bodies at the rapture. And, uh, Jerusalem has been prepared at this point as a bride, ready for the union with the new earth, uh, for her husband, which will be at that point uh, in, in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think Ephesians 1.10 also is a good uh, verse making the point that uh, in eternity, earth uh, is and heaven are compatible. So people thinking that heaven couldn't be on earth because earth is under sin and con the curse, well, it will no longer be under the curse of sin at that point. Okay, he sa says, utopian idealists who dream of mankind creating, quote, heaven on earth, unquote, are destined for disappointment. But though they are wrong in believing that humans can achieve a utopian existence apart from God, the reality of heaven on earth, God dwelling with mankind in the world he made for us, will in fact be realized. It is God's dream. It is God's plan. He, not we, will accomplish it. Hallelujah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, as far as the fruit is concerned that they ate in the garden, it was the same utopian fruit, I believe, that was man exalting himself trying to make heaven on earth. And the Tower of Babel being the, the uh, what happened uh, was man was trying to get to heaven by himself, and God confused that because no matter what man is going to do, he's never going to create heaven. Mm -hmm. On earth, yeah, yeah, you know, it, you know, I'm so glad Mitch said that. He's right on with that, and I'm glad he brought that up because if you look through history and all those who ever came along who promised a utopian ideal all through history, all those things resulted in devastating effects. They they, they were all went went terribly wrong. <laughs> yeah, a uh, good point. Uh, we can all count on Brother Mitch to bring that back into focus. Uh, it's it's the, mo the most important thing for man to understand is that uh, whenever man thinks he doesn't need God, that he's capable of creating utopia or achieving, uh, working his way to heaven without God, he can do it on his own efforts, uh, that's what um, causes failure. Man's incapable, and we need to come to the conclusion that we are incapable, and we need God to accomplish this for us. And that's what the point here is that uh, this utopia, this heaven on earth, is going to happen. But not because man did it, but because God wants to do it, and he will. Okay, uh, now, the question. Do we remain conscious after death? Okay, quote, The dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to God who gave it, unquote. That's Ecclesiastes 12.7. At death, the human spirit goes either to heaven or hell. Uh, that's an airy sound for what we're what we're talking about. <laughs> wow, man, that's really eerie. Uh, it reminds me um, many times I've been preaching on Las Vegas Boulevard, and. Um, I have to pause and stop because a an ambulance is going by and the siren's going off. And I pause and I wait and I say, you hear that ambulance? I hope this is a stark warning to everyone that the person inside the ambulance never expected to be there today. And, and sometimes death comes suddenly <coughs> without any warning. And that's why you don't put off till tomorrow what you can do today. Today is the day of salvation. Put your faith in Jesus today. That person in the ambulance, I hope that they did that before that they, they were there. And so sometimes in the ambulance coming out of nowhere, you know, uh, it really does have a, in, in, in impact if we understand uh, uh, maybe it's not just a coincidence. 
All right, so it goes on to say, at death, the, uh, the human spirit goes either to heaven or hell. Christ depicted Lazarus and the rich man as conscious in he heaven and hell. Um, actually, that was, uh, that was Hades, and um, it was uh, in the two compartments were called paradise and torments. Right, uh, but uh, that's that was a temporary. That was the old way. Remember, uh, Randy Alcorn referred to this old this old heaven, and then there's the temporary heaven now, and then the future heaven on earth. Well, this is referring to uh, before the cross, man had to go, die and go to this temporary place of torments or this temporary place paradise, waiting for right. Jesus to pay for our sins. So it says Christ depicted Lazarus and the rich man as conscious. In heaven and hell, immediately after they died, that's Luke 16, verses 22 through 31. Jesus told the dying thief on the cross, quote, Today you will be with me in paradise. That's Luke 23, 43. The Apostle Paul said that to die was to be with Christ. That's Philippians 1, 23. And to be absent from the body was to be present with the Lord, that's 2 Corinthians 5, 8. After their deaths, martyrs are pictured in heaven, crying out to God to bring justice on earth. That's Revelation 6, 9 through 11. So these verses he's using to cite that man does have a conscious existence after death. And we're going to go next into this idea of soul sleep which is promoted by some people who think that there's no conscious existence uh, after death. Uh, so what do you think of those verses he cited? Uh, can you think of anything else uh, or any comments on this idea that after we die, we're not an uncon in an unconscious state like sleep? Okay, he goes on to say, these passages make it clear that there is no such thing as soul sleep. I was going to... Long... Huh? Sorry, I, I just didn't quite oh, open my mouth in time about when you said any passages that say that soul sleep is not, um, is not a biblical concept. I immediately thought of the thief on the cross when he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. He didn't say... Mm -hmm. After a few million, uh, a few a few hundred years of soul sleep, you'll be with me in paradise. <laughs> right. Yes. Amen. Okay. Uh, so it says uh, these passages make it clear that there is no such thing as soul sleep or a long period of unconsciousness between life on earth and life in heaven. The phrase "quote fallen asleep." Unquote, in 1 Thessalonians 4.13 and similar passages is a euphemism for death, describing the body's outward appearance. The spirit's departure from the body ends our existence on earth. The physical part of us sl quote, sleeps unquote, until the resurrection, while the spiritual part of us relocates to a conscious existence in heaven. Uh, Daniel let me ask you guys to look this up. Uh, Eric, look up Daniel 12, verses 2 and 3. Uh, Jack said you look up 2 Corinthians 5, 8. Some Old Testament passages such as Ecclesiastes 9, 5. Uh, Mitch, could you look up Ecclesiastes 9, 5? If I can find it, I've got to find a Bible. Maybe uh, find it online here. I'll have Austin do it then. Austin, you look up Ecclesiastes 9, 5. Okay. Sure thing. Uh, these tr verses address outward appearances and do not reflect the fullness of New Testament revelation concerning immediate relocation and consciousness after death. <clears throat> so let's look at those verses and see what they say. Okay, I've got the Daniel verses if you want to okay, hear those now. We'll give everybody a chance to kind of look up their other verses. Um, Daniel 12.2 says, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And verse 3 says, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. I didn't get anything from that second part about uh, sleep. What, 
Was there something in there? It didn't say it. I mean, I I don't really see. I think it was a stretch to use three. I don't think three was unless there was another. Unless it was actually a different verse, and I'm. Okay, Daniel twelve two and verse th two and three. Okay, uh, so that talks about. Read the first part that says sleep again. Um. The verse, in verse 2 it says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Okay. Now, someone who believes in soul sleep, for example, um, uh, Jehovah Witnesses, and I think maybe Seventh-day Adventists, I can't recall if they do or not, believe they believe so. that you're, uh, you're unconscious until the resurrection. You don't have any mm -hmm. awareness. Mm -hmm. There's no temporary... Uh, temporary heaven that like we're discussing uh, and they use verses like that uh, and to, to account for soul sleep a brother sent me uh, a lot of verses trying to convince me of soul sleep like a year or two ago and it's interesting there are a lot of verses that they can use to make their point but the point Randy Alcorn makes here is that these verses refer to the body being like like it's sleeping it's the body that needs to be awakened and come back to life through the resurrection but the soul itself is uh, conscious so, so who has another verse I got uh, Ecclesiastes 9 5 okay it says for the living know that they shall die but the dead know not anything neither have they any more a reward for the memory of them is forgotten hmm that's a famous soul sleep verse they say the dead know nothing <laughs> So they want to make the point that if the dead know nothing, that there's no conscious state for the dead. They're unconscious. They know nothing. Okay, Mitch, what's yours? Or whoever's got the next one? I've got um, I've got Second uh, Corinthians five eight, which says, "We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord." Okay. And there's not in a state of sleeping for many hundred years. Yeah. Now, how would a uh, soul sleep uh, person, advocate, answer Paul's state declaration there, absent from the body and present with the Lord? Because I've, I've talked to them enough to know they have an answer for that. Okay. Okay. Uh, they would argue that the, um, as far as you know, you're, you died, and you, and you're immediately with the Lord because you're unconscious. You weren't aware of how much time has passed. That's really, really weak, in my opinion, because that's saying that you're not actually present. Therefore, the actual meaning of this verse isn't actually true. That's, yeah, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with uh, I'd agree with Jackson on that point. I think the, the the very the fact that you're invoking the word presence it, in, insinuates you're aware. It's awareness. You can't be present and unaware. It doesn't really make sense. Yeah, um, in other words, it doesn't say we'll be present. We'll, we'll be confident, and it'll feel like we're present. It doesn't say we'll feel like. It just says yeah, and that's happy. why I think even that's a stretch because to say feel like you're present, you're still feeling something, so you're still aware of something. So it's it's still yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. If a dead person's simply a <laughs> totally out of it, and you, there wouldn't there be no sense of presence. There'd be no. Yeah, now, no, I'm not saying I'm dogmatic on this. If somebody out there's listening and they believe on believe in soul sleep, because so many times, because of all these dogmatic people, just stating you disagree with something could be taken as a statement of dogmatism. But I will right. say I don't think that's a strong point. Right. Yeah. Um. And, of course, the idea that Jesus told the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. He didn't say, uh, you'll think, you'll believe that it was t today, but it's really, a th you know, uh, several thousand uh, years uh, when, when the resurrection comes, that then you'll be with me in paradise. No. So it, the it's, language would have even been different. He would have said something if he was going to make that statement, like, you shall you shall fall asleep and when you will wake up with me in paradise. Mm -hmm. I don't think he would have said to dead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, are there any of these verses that we haven't covered yet? Who didn't read their verse? Uh oh. 
reading right there. Mitch, I think. I, I don't have a Bible on me. I don't. Okay, know Austin has one, right? I, yeah. I lost my Bible. I, I read I read Ecclesiastes nine five. Oh, okay. All right. So every reference in Revelation to human beings talking and worshiping in heaven prior to the resurrection of the dead demonstrates that our spiritual uh, beings are conscious, not sleeping after death. Nearly everyone who believes in soul sleep believes that souls are disembodied at death. It's not clear how disembodied beings could sleep being uh, because sleeping involves a physical body. So these are some of Randy Alcorn's arguments against the t interpreting these verses as soul sleep. Uh, what do you think of the idea that when there are verses that say that uh, in this intermediate heaven that people are actually talking, having conversations, and they have this consciousness of an awareness? It brings up the transfiguration in my mind. Uh, well, yeah, that's another that's another good verse that uh, I know that we'll be discussing that later too. But uh, here's an example of uh, uh, who is it? Moses and Elijah, mm -hmm. and they certainly were conscious uh, after death, and they were before the resurrection. Okay, um, let's. It says, "Will we be judged when we die? When we die, we face judgment. What is called the judgment of faith." The outcome of this judgment determines whether we go to the intermediate heaven or the intermediate hell. This initial judgment depends not on our works, but on our faith. It is not about what we've done during our lives, but about what Christ has done for us. If we accepted Christ's atoning death for us, then God judges us after we die. He sees his son's sacrifice for us, not our sin. Salvation is a free gift to which we can contribute absolutely nothing. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, Titus 3, 5. So uh, have you thought of it that way before, that uh, uh, when we die, uh, when everybody dies, they have this initial judgment, and the judgment is not for works. It's judgment only for your faith. Yes, because it, otherwise, if there, if there was no judgment, by what decision would it would it be made? Where you which, which place you go? There had to be a judgment made. Either you had the faith and you went to heaven, or you did not and you went to hell. It's one of the two options. So a judgment, a decision had to be made. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, it kind of goes back to this question I've asked many times in my videos. Uh, uh, D. James Kennedy, uh, in his uh, course on evangelism, he called it the diagnostic question. And uh, someone made a video about me recently, and they called it uh, Luke's litmus test. But this is the question that basically that Randy Alcorn is alluding to here, and that is the question is, after you die, the question is, why should I let you into heaven? And if someone says, well, Lord, Lord, look at all the wonderful things I did in your name. He says, depart from me, <laughs> worker of iniquity. They're trying to be justified by their works, and no, they can't be justified by their works. When we die, we're only justified by our faith. So the proper answer to the question is, why should I let you into heaven? Is because of my faith in Jesus. Do you have faith in Jesus? Do you believe he's your Savior? Or do you believe that you're capable of, of uh, getting into heaven without him? Or do you believe well, uh, that Jesus is not enough? Other, What's that? The other side of that, the other side of that question is also to add to that too is what Jesus do you believe in? You know, many yeah. people, many people who say, "Oh, I did wonderful things in Jesus' name. I did all this." But there are people who say, "Well, Jesus was a wonderful man and a wonderful teacher, but he wasn't God and he wasn't the only way to heaven." So it's like, what Jesus do you believe in? <laughs> yeah. Or uh, also, what about to add even more confusion? What about the people who say, "Jesus is my savior, but other people might have another way that works for them." Or something exactly, like that. Exactly, that there that are many ways. Like that's right. really trusting to me. Right, exactly. Because then you think you have another hope besides Jesus, really, is mm -hmm. what you're saying by saying that. So, uh, Rel Randy Alcorn is making the point, that matter of fact, this is the point that, that all of us on the panel spend most of our time focusing on. And, and that is, uh, what is this test 
for us to get into heaven? Are we tested based upon how good of a person we are or how religious or all the good deeds we do? Or, or is the test question, do you believe in Jesus? In Jesus? Uh, are, is your, are you, are, are you going to be justified by your performance or by Jesus' performance on your behalf? Is your faith in Jesus for your salvation, or is your, your, is your faith in yourself and your own ability? So it's a judgment of faith, and that if we have if we pass that test, the test is: Do you, is your faith in the Savior, or is your faith in something else? If your faith is in the Savior, you go to this intermediate heaven. If your faith is in something else, like your religion or your own performance, then you go to this intermediate hell. Okay. This first judgment is not to be confused with the final judgment or what is called the judgment of works. Both believers and unbelievers face the final judgment. The Bible indicates that all believers will stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of their lives. That's in Romans 14, verses 10 through 12, and 2 Corinthians verses 5, I mean chapter 5, verse 10. It's critical to understand that this judgment is a judgment of works, not of faith. Uh, our works do not affect our salvation, but they do affect our rewards. Rewards are about our work for God, empowered by His Spirit. Rewards are conditional, dependent on our faithfulness. So, uh, how would you sum this up so far? You've got this first judgment is a judgment on faith, of faith, and the second judgment is the judgment of works. And both believers and non-believers have to go both through both of these judgments, don't they? Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, I mean, Randy lays out beautifully what everyone was talking about in, in reference to works, not comparing that to salvation. Salvation is not a work. And he lays it out, I think, real. This is one of the pieces I'd like to pull right out of the book and kind of put somewhere where I can kind of hold on to it to show these verses because what he lays out right there is exactly what we're trying to to convey to people who are trying to say, no, you, you don't have good works or you keep sinning, then you're going to lose your salvation and things of that nature. No, your salvation is not conditional. It's not yeah. conditional. If, if, if it's conditional, then it's not free. Anything that's got a condition attached is not free. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, so when I die, I'm going to be judged first on my faith. And my faith is in my Savior Jesus, so I'll pass that judgment. And then at, at the resurrection, we get judged again uh, based upon our works. And I'm going to be judged on my works. And maybe, maybe Jesus will say, those hangouts you did with the brethren there, uh, I'm going to give you some rewards for that because you helped the world understand me and, and, and come to me. So maybe we'll get some rewards for that if he thinks that it's, uh, it's worthy. Uh, but, and, and anything that I did that was not worthy will, as the scriptures say, be burned up and it's useless. Uh, but anything that I did uh, for my Savior after I got saved that was worthy, uh, God has rewards in store for, for me. And guess what? Mitch, he may have some rewards in store for you too. Uh, yeah, I hope to get some good ones. Yeah, for, yeah, I'm looking for some big prizes up there. So. <laughs> I want, you know, what I really want? I really want the rod of iron in Revelation because I love stimming with sticks outside. <laughs> I always have since I was a kid, whirling those sticks. I can't do that with the rod of iron if I get one. Okay. Now, unbelievers face a final judgment of, uh, of works as well. And, and uh, the Bible tells us it will come at the great white throne judgment at the, uh, at the end of the old earth and just before the beginning of the new earth. Um, opinions vary about when the judgment of works for believers will occur. Some people picture it occurring immediately after the judgment of faith. A quote, one at a time judgment happening as each believer dies. Others think it happens in the intermediate heaven between our death and the return of Christ. Those who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture often envision the judgment of works happening between the rapture and the physical return of Christ, while the tribulation 
uh, is taking place on Earth, still others believe it happens at the same time as the Great White Throne Judgment of unbelievers after the millennium. You guys have an opinion on that? I say uh, it would happen right after death. You know, the first initial faith and then the worst. Be I don't. I don't see why it would put it off. I mean, might as well just get over with. Hmm. You know, until I read this book here, uh, I, it never entered into my mind that uh, there was a one at a time uh, rewards judgment. Uh, uh, I, I I always assumed that the judgment seat of Christ for our rewards was after the rapture and resurrection, uh, as a as a group, a, uh, a well maybe one at a time, but we're all judged at the same time, but but uh, individually for our works. Uh, this idea of one at a time for your rewards is a new idea for me. Uh, and then Austin he immediately embraces that, so you can see that uh, how people could come to different conclusions on that. Anybody have any uh, uh, strong opinion on it, or do you think I, it's important? No, you know it's funny. It's funny. I mean, I'd always had a strong opinion about what I thought it was, but I'm not. I mean, I'm not going to be dogmatic about it. Um, I, I tend to think it's more uh, during you know our our judgment, the judgment seat of Christ is going to happen, uh, coinciding with the rapture and when, when and while the tribulation is going on, while we're in heaven, uh, having the marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, I, I think it's I think it's more going to coincide with something like that, or possibly rewards uh, at the time of the Great White Throne Judgment for us a separate a separate judgment for that time for rewards. That's I guess a possibility. I'm willing to leave that open. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything crystal clear that really you could pinpoint in the Bible that really crystal clear puts that into a uh, progress. I mean, the only thing in answer to what Austin was asking, the only thing I would say is. It's not that there's any reason to put it off. It's that the only thing that needs to happen immediately in that case is a judgment of faith has to happen immediately because you have to, it has you have to be determined as far as where you are going, um, whether it's going to be heaven or whether it's going to be hell. Um, so that's the only thing that has to happen at that point. Um, but there's nothing really. I, I'd say I, I mean it's it's fair to it's fair to think that might be the case. I don't, like I said, I don't think there's anything concrete that really. Nails it down to one time. I don't think there is any. Yeah, is this a, is this something worth uh, you know um, arguing over and and fighting over, or is this uh, yeah. something that is? is uh, yeah. I I I don't know wh how I came to that conclusion. Probably from reading a lot of people's teachings on eschatology, I got that, and I'm not. I couldn't off the top of my head give you verses to support one way or the other. Uh, but there, there may be some verses to support uh, my opinion on it because it's based upon things I've studied. But I can't tell you what verses would support it or not. But I, I, again, this is one of many things where I think that uh, Austin, you can yeah. still, you can still be part of our group. We're not going to shun you over that. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, guys. <laughs> no, Wait, absolutely. It's, it's that. I'm a little confused between the difference exactly between the two point of views. Is it just the timing of when we'll sit, stand before the judgment seat? Well, timing and uh, uh, format. Uh, the, the, in other words, if I died right now, if Austin's right, I'm judged uh, by my faith, so I have eternal life in heaven, and then, and I also immediately get judged individually right, right then to get my rewards. Uh, but if Austin's wrong and the other position is correct, uh, I would first get judged for my faith and get eternal life in heaven. And then after the uh, rapture occurs and the resurrection, then we all have this great white throne judgment in mass. And all the believers, uh, all the saints, are judged for their works and get rewards at that time. But wait, a believer never sits before, stands before the great white throne, right? Did, right. did I say great white throne? I meant judgment seat of Christ. If I said okay, okay, right. no, no. All right, yeah. Um, I hope Austin is right. I want to get that out of the way. I'm. I haven't studied it in depth to um, to know exactly. Well, you know, uh, this actually this. I know I read the book before, but this I don't have any memory of reading that because it seemed like I would have remembered it one at a time, judgment for rewards. Uh, but it's a it's a new idea to me. I don't know. Uh, I'd like to kind of interject on this whole okay. rewards point. If 
if we as Christians are competing with one another for rewards or place in heaven, and we look at Jesus' example of washing the disciples' feet, and the arguments of who will be first and who will be last in the kingdom of heaven, those who will be last will be first, then everybody racing to be last will be racing to be first. So, so basically anybody who's looking at this thinking to themselves, well, if there's rewards in heaven, what that could set up is that could set up some sort of pompous, proud, even pharisaical attitude in Christianity that, that I don't think fits. So there is a place because, of course, you know, who will sit at my right hand, who will sit at my left hand, this is what he said, that, that's, that's been determined in heaven already, who will sit here, who will sit there. That's not for, for, for you to judge this person's or that person's position in the kingdom. So uh, by and large, I think that the main thing is is that whether our, our actions are judged in heaven and puts us in some sort of place in heaven shouldn't matter to us whatsoever because if the, even if it did matter to us, then we would start trying to do things just for trying to get rewards in competition with one another. Mm -hmm. And so I really look at my walk with Christ as my personal walk with him. Mm -hmm. I love you. Yeah, I think those are all very good points. Uh, I think there is a scripture where Paul was talking about uh, I, not competing against people. In other words, there's it's not like a zero sum game where there's a million rewards, mm -hmm. and that's the that's a finite number, and uh, everybody's trying to get their sh their biggest share of those rewards. And mm -hmm. no, there's an unlimited. You can get all the rewards. Everybody can have all the rewards they want. Uh, there's no en endless. Uh, there's no limit limit on it. So it's not a competition against each other. It's uh, just a um, an effort. Uh, but now, is it could it cause uh, some problems? And uh, well, I think Paul talks about uh, working for those like it's a good thing. But I also have uh, thought that our motivation may also be a factor in terms of whether we our work is worthy or not. Not only it's not only what you did, but why you did it. And maybe if someone is doing it and their focus is just on trying to build up, and on the other hand, we're told to try to build up treasures in heaven. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's nothing wrong with that as a motivation. Well, you know, there's I, something else I want to interject about that and kind of base it also on what Mitch was saying. And I think, I think um, in the minds of some people, they do almost see it as like a competition thing. It's like I want to, you know, and I think it, it, one of the reasons why I believe it's going to happen um, – after the rapture, at the point where um, you know we're having the marriage supper uh, and at the judgment seat of Christ, would happen at that point is because I believe the receiving of rewards number one is going to more entail us once we've received our perfected bodies. We are really who we are going to be going into the millennium and eternity. We're going to learn at that point in time what all of our rewards are going to be for us going into the millennium and then into eternity. It's really about that. Um, the other side of that is I believe it's going to be the, um, the mindset we have as people now, we kind of will lose that, and in heaven it's going to really be a celebration of the rewards that fellow believers have received. I don't think we're going to see it as something that's a, I lost this, I didn't get that, you got this, I got that. I think it's going to be something more aligned, and that's why I kind of see it more happening then, because it's an overall celebration um, by all believers of seeing all the various rewards that all of us are going to receive and sharing that together. Yeah, if you have a sinless nature, that would just that would exclude jealousy. Just to uh, just to build on Eric's point. Exactly. If I, I don't jealousy think... excluded. If I have if I have if I have jealousy excluded from my nature, and I see you guys earned more rewards than I did, I'm not going to think to myself for one second, oh shoot, I wish I had more rewards. I'm jealous of them. I'm going to be like, yeah, I'm so proud of you guys for earning all those rewards. Yeah, exactly. 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 Yeah. Jackson's going to get in a fight with him with his iron rod. We're going to have the angels break it up. <laughs> I'm going to stem with that thing if I get it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I remember many years ago, um, I had just started street preaching, and uh, so some of the people I was hanging out with then, uh, the topic came up of rewards, and someone said, "Well, wh why are you doing this? Uh, uh, are you are you doing it uh, because um, you want to earn rewards, or are you doing it because you want to please God, or are you doing it because you care about the lost?" 
And I said, well, to me, maybe it's a combination of all of it. My, I think my primary motivation is uh, to, because I love God. I just want to talk about Jesus. I just love saying his name to people. And, and I'm glorifying, giving the glory to him. And then my second motivation is I do care about the lost. I want them to understand this free gift. And then finally, if I'm going to get rewards in addition to that, that's like icing on the cake. Amen to that. Amen. Okay, the question is, is the intermediate heaven part of our universe or another? The present heaven is normally invisible to those living on earth. For those who have trouble accepting the reality of an unseen realm, consider the perspective of cutting-edge researchers who embrace string theory. Scientists at Yale, Princeton, and Stanford, among others, postulate that there are ten unobservable dimensions and likely an infinite number of imperceptible universes. If this is what leading scientists believe, why should anyone feel self-conscious about believing in one unobservable dimension, a realm containing angels and heaven and hell? Well, but just you saying science believes in it, that's why I have to doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what, what's interesting yeah. to, uh, to me about, about what you just read there is when I was maybe, um, maybe like 14, 15, I was, I mean, I, 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 um, I was really intrigued by kind of new age and even occult kind of ideologies. Not that I believed in them ever, because I thought it's kind of interesting, it's mystical, it opens up other dimensions and everything. And obviously, I, I never followed it or, follow, or, or, or pursued that because I knew it was wrong and everything. But really, that quote is just, just illuminating to me that all that stuff and better, as far as the elements of mysteriousness and other dimensions and all that stuff, is really existent within the true Christian faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't want anyone to misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not at all saying we're like New Age people. We don't look at it that way at all. But the idea of mystery and other realms and that kind of thing is existent within the Bible, if that makes sense. Yeah. I, uh, uh, I have a video titled, uh, Proving the Bible is True. And uh, I talk about science. I talk about evolution, creationism, and, and uh, Bible prophecies and all kinds of things. But one of the points I make in there, in that video, is that the I claim that science has always lagged centuries behind the Bible, and I cite many examples. And in this case, this this is just another example. I mean, you know, Bible always talks about this this other dimension, this spiritual dimension, and now science finally realizes, and yeah, there are other invisible dimensions. Yeah, in fact, I want to build on that. That's that's great that you said that, Luke. Um, I was reading some articles. It's been a little while now, but the more work that's been done, I mean, historically, the idea of other dimensions, even in the scientific community, was kind of looked at as supernatural. It was kind of looked at as, eh, I can't see it, I can't touch it. It's not really something we are sure is there, so they kind of cast it aside. But more of the work that's been done more recently when dealing with quantum physics, quantum mechanics, a lot of these guys have started to see that there are these other dimensions. They believe these are, there are these other dimensions that they directly influence the dimension we know that we're in. So it's pretty interesting. It's like, it's like it's one of like what you talked about. They're kind of catching up now saying, well, yeah, well, we always believe there were other dimensions. We believe in a heaven. We believe in a hell. We believe, <laughs> and we always believe, we believe there's an angelic realm where Lucifer and the, and the demons dwell in. They, are, they influence us and they do things from this, from this unseen dimension that they're in that we can't quite see and touch. But we've always been saying that. And they've always been quick to say, no, that's supernatural. You know? But then they start talking about it in a scientific way and say, well, now we're seeing there are these dimensions. It's funny how they're willing to change their mind now and start to say, oh, well, now this is true scientifically. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Materialism, you know, this, this whole idea of materialism, this was an idea that Hitler has, a lot of atheists have, that if you can't, if there's nothing beyond what you can touch or what's measurable. And uh, this has been... Uh, this blows away atheism, uh, and I really think that it may may well be for a reason because I don't really think that atheism is going to to last. 
uh, just due to the idea, the, the spirit of the Antichrist, if you're going to worship a beast, it's not going to be an atheist beast. So, so if, if they might not worship God, they may realize a, a, a spiritual realm, but uh, they might not see the God that created it as the God who created it. And mm -hmm. uh, so um, I really think that it might be just like these Scientology people or, or even L. Ron Hubbard and, and his type of ideas. These kind of ideas are going to lead into, um, into uh, I guess, uh, New Age Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the Bible teaches that sometimes humans are allowed to see into heaven. When Stephen was being stoned because of his faith in Christ, he gazed into heaven. Quote, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. That's Acts 7, verse 55 and 56. Scripture tells us not that Stephen dreamed this, but he, that he actually saw it. I haven't seen it. Uh, one of the things that, that Jesus uh, said is so important. When, when uh, Thomas, the Apostle Thomas, doubted the resurrection, and then Jesus appeared to him, and Thomas had to see him with his own eyes and touch him, put his fingers into Jesus' wounds, and then he believed. And he said, my Lord and my God, to Jesus. Jesus answered him, he said, now that uh, you've seen me, you believe, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. So there's something that, that Jesus really values about believing in him even though we haven't seen. And that's what we all, unless you guys want to tell me some experience you've had where you've seen Jesus or you've seen things, but I've never seen heaven and I've never seen Jesus. I've never had these visions or these out-of-body experiences like Paul had. And uh, and yet I, I still believe. I, I do pray all the time that <laughs> would you give me a vision of heaven or let me dream of heaven or something. I'd love to, to have that, but uh, I have faith in, in spite of not having seen. Well, I actually am not so sure I would take a vision of heaven if I could, just simply because when he says that, blessings are those who believe and have not seen, my thought is maybe those of us will, will get some kind of reward for believing in spite of seeing. I mean, it, uh, granted, if he told me it's not going to affect that because you already believed or something, then I, mm -hmm. then I might out of curiosity. But let's not forget the point I made, too, at the beginning of our study, that part of heaven that will be really cool will be discovering some of the mystery and the unknown and everything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and yeah. that right there, that right there, Jackson, is a very mature outlook, and it's something that Christians need to pick up on. It's a willingness to say no. You know, I, I a, a lot of Christians do have the tendency, and I I have too. You know, oh, sure, I'd love to see, uh, you know, right there, proof right in front of me. And I definitely have instances in my life where I know things have happened, and they've happened in such a way that there's no other answer, but I, I could see it was God intervening in my life. Yeah. And, I, I, and, and clearly, I mean, there's just, I mean, these are clear messages. But what you said was absolutely true. It's when you go, when you go a step back and say, well, you know, Jesus is saying there's a blessing there for those who haven't seen. Maybe it's better if I keep my faith the way it is and I haven't seen something because I'll get a greater blessing for that. That's a very mature, uh, mm -hmm. it's a very mature outlook on that. Well, yeah. thank you. Uh, what I'm, what I, the other thing too is not not only even if he's just saying that, which I'm not at all convinced. Let's say he is just saying, "Blessed are those who have, haven't seen," and there's no more reward for it or anything. It's still like like I I'm I you know I, I like anime and stuff, and I was I I remember I accidentally read a spoiler for Gundam Seed, the series I was going through, and I had to watch a, I had to marathon the episodes, and I was so disappointed that I knew what was going to happen at this point. Because it would have been a really, other, because otherwise it would have been a really shocking part and everything. No, that's a great, that's a great comparison. That's actually. And so, so even if, G, and, but the thing is, I'm not at all convinced that what I said earlier isn't also true, that there may be some reward for it. I think that's quite possible. But what I'm saying is, even if there isn't, 
Um, I'm still not convinced it's not a better option because I was really disappointed to find out that plot twist early. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a very, very interesting point. Well, what would our faith be if everybody got a vision? If, if we would Practically, it would be like we're all in heaven, wouldn't it? I'm not sure. If, everybody, if, if God faith, talked to everybody on earth, it would be like, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm I mean that's sure. that's a great point point by Mitch there because I mean it's like you know, you you, you w what is it to say that you know, if everybody does see if everybody receives a, a vision where Jesus is standing right before him and he's right there physically and says here I am here you go then is it really a special have you really um have you really put your your faith into as much and I think it's a great it's a really great point too. Yeah, I think that the uh, I made a video titled Faith. The one requirement, and uh, one of the points I made in that I think is relevant to this is that the uh, Paul did not have faith, and if it, because Jesus <laughs> appeared to him, he had knowledge. So it, it, it once you have knowledge, it's no more faith is required because you've you've seen it, you touched it. Thomas didn't have faith; he he was shown it was true. If we got to have these visions, then we wouldn't have faith anymore. We'd have knowledge. We'd have experience of it. Um, so the, the scripture says, faith is the substance of things seen. No, the evidence of things evidence not seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Right. Finally got it right. Well, you know what's, what's interesting so, about that is I, I sometimes hear grace believers say, that believing and faith are, are, are one and the same. I'm not, I'm not so sure after this conversation I fully agree with that, even though I certainly think faith includes believing, and believing is what saves us and everything. Faith may, by what you just said there, include the idea that um, you haven't seen it for yourself, if that makes sense. Uh, and therefore think, Thomas was still saved by believing, and yet it wasn't faith for him because he had seen it. Yeah. And yeah, it was no more faith for him. But I, I, th I like what uh, um, Bob Wilkin, how we use that word convinced. And I think, Mitch, this goes along with some of the things you and I have talked about, about faith and believing and where this comes from. And it really it just comes to the point where you're convinced. Uh, when you're convinced of something, you believe it. A person can't just make up their mind to believe something. If they're not convinced of it, they can say, I'm going to believe it anyway, but they don't really believe until they're convinced. Well, you can't make yourself believe something. Yeah, you can't. You either I can, believe. I, I can't say to somebody. I've said this on videos before. Okay, in order to get to heaven, you have to believe in reindeer. You have to believe that Santa Claus comes and delivers presents. Now, just yeah. believe that, and you'll be saved. I yeah. don't know how many people would be saved. But on the yeah. other hand, if coming into heaven, somebody comes and Jesus says, "Well, why should I let you into the kingdom of heaven?" So I think is a hypothetical because I really think that Jesus like get in here. But I'm not so so sure I agree that you can't force yourself to believe something. I think most naturally it's being convinced. But when I was younger, I wanted certain things to be true so badly, and even not when I was younger, that I forced myself to believe it to the point where I actually thought it. So I kind of convinced myself. Well, I, I, think, you can, I think you can force yourself to trust. You can say, okay... I'm not 100% sure one way or the other. I don't really know. Uh, I, another, I can't make myself necessarily believe, but I'm going to trust anyway. It's like stepping off the edge of a, a cliff. All right. I told, I told you, look, yes. it's like in one of these movies I saw. There's an invisible uh, steps going across this chasm. You can't see it. If you step off and it's not there, you'll fall to your death. But if you step off and it's there, it's a step of faith, you can't see it, but you can choose to trust it. You can't mm -hmm. choose to necessarily uh, believe it's there, you just have to trust it, and by taking that step of faith, you're trusting that what I said was true. Well, there, there was my point, Luke. Um, if somebody's coming and going, if somebody asked them, do you believe that you, that, or, 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 or why should I let you into the kingdom of heaven, and the person says, well, I don't know if I had enough faith. I don't know that I had enough faith. And there's a lot of people out there with these doubts in their mind, but they have taken that step. Or they logically, they know, but they don't know completely because they haven't experienced. I would have to say that that, 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 that little mustard seed is quite enough. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and, and well, that, that, these, well, that, these people that doubt have yeah. need to be secure, more secure on the ideas. You don't see Christ. So, but having that that little bit of faith, knowing you know what, I see it. I it's incredible, but I see it and I believe it. But I, I can't experience it till I'm there. And then to get there and go, I don't know if I have enough faith. I think Christ will say, "You have plenty of faith. Come in here." You know, uh, when uh, when after our last show, uh, we were all talking afterwards. We got in a conversation about the street preaching I'd done. I told you about this sign, this big banner that I had. And I had to choose uh, on one side of the banner um, two words. Because if you're holding a, a banner and you want people to see it and read it from a distance, you can't have 10 words or 20 words because they'd have to be real small and they couldn't see it from a distance. So I had to decide... What I'm only the only way it's going to really be visible from a distance is to have two words. What two words can I put on here? That what are the two? Uh, if I had to reduce it down to two words so that they could hear what they need to know about Jesus, what would I say? And I chose the words trust Jesus. Oh, I got it. Go look. I put it on the chat. Bingo. Right now. Was, uh, Austin's got it right there. He put it Last, up before anybody said anything. Yeah, but, <laughs> I, I, oh, it's in the chat. No, Last time, I just completely guessed that because Luke never said anything. What they put on. Yep. <laughs> yeah. No, and, it's it's and that, true. That's to me. That's to me the real question. Uh, even though uh, I, I I don't I haven't seen it or anything, and I, maybe I don't have all kinds of proof or anything. But I'm choosing to trust Jesus. Yeah. I read what he's. I read this uh, the Bible. What it said. He said in the Bible, and I'm going to make a choice. I'm going to trust him. I'm going to well, believe it's it's true. salvation. I think comes down to the way I'd say it, and then I'll let Jackson say what he was going to say. Was, the way I'd put it is, you know, it, it, it's a faith to belief. It's a combination of the two things. I can have a sep- I can separate the two. Faith, faith, and this is what I think Mitch was talking about. Faith requires that leap into the unknown. It, it requires a leap. Otherwise, it doesn't mean anything really. I mean, I mean, I, I can the weatherman tells me it's going to snow tomorrow. I can believe it's going to snow tomorrow because the weatherman told me it's going to snow tomorrow. I, I can believe that, but it doesn't require anything for me. It doesn't really take anything. I mean, the belief that we have in Jesus requires the faith of that leap into the unknown, something we can't see, that so something that we're not is not right in front of us, and yet and yet we're asked to accept, you know. Um, Based on based on our knowledge of what we come to know about God and what the Holy Spirit reveals to us, we come to just it, it's a great it's about the unknown and not knowing. Yeah, if we had you standing uh, up and said fall backwards, we'll catch you. Right. Uh, and, and you'd have to have, believe that we would do what we said. You'd have to have faith in us that we're telling you the truth and we're right. not only able but faithful to catch you. Right. And uh, that's kind of a good example, I guess. Mm-hmm. Well, All right. know, one thing I was going to put out, though, is that uh, I think that's the cool thing about faith. You know, everybody has a different way how they got it, or how they kept it, or how they learned it. And that's uh, that's our own unique thing about it. You know, if everybody had the vision like what Mitch said, it wouldn't be any good. You know, everybody everybody also experiences it in another way, another fashion, another time. Uh, another circumstance, maybe they go through different trials through it. They learn through th- uh, new things through it, and now I, that's like everybody. Everybody's not meant to be a pastor. Everybody's not meant to speak in tongues. Everybody's not meant Ooh. to interpret dreams. You know, we all have our yeah. own unique faith that's attributed and accredited to us. That one day we'll actually get to see it all spread out through time, and we can, you know, Jesus go on the timeline of our faith, and we can see what we did and how we helped others. That that that, mm-hmm. that our own is unique gift. Yeah. Well, we kind of got off, and even though it's a great uh, topic, uh, we kind of got, got off on this question of faith when we're talking about is the intermediate heaven part of our universe or another? So let me get back to that. So as Wayne Grudem points out that Stephen, quote, did not see mere symbols of a state of existence. It was rather that his eyes were open to see a spiritual dimension of reality which God has hidden from us in this present age, a dimension which nonetheless really does exist in our space-time universe and within which Jesus now lives in his physical resurrected body, waiting even now for a time when he will return to the earth. 
So he's making the point that Stephen's vision wasn't just symbols. It was an actual, an actual reality that he was able to see. I agree with Grudem that the intermediate heaven is a space-time universe. He may be right that it's part of our own universe, or it may be in a different universe. It may be a universe next door that's normally hidden but sometimes opened. In either case, it seems likely that God didn't merely create a vision for Stephen in order to make heaven appear phys physical. In order to make heaven appear physical. Rather, he allowed Stephen to see an intermediate heaven that was and is physical. Hmm. Okay, the prophet Elisha asked God to give his servant Gehazi a glimpse of the invisible realm. He prayed, quote, O Lord, open his eyes so he may see, unquote. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. That's in 2 Kings 6.17. It could be argued that these horses and chariots with angelic warriors exist beside us in our universe, but we are normally blind to them. Or they may be in a universe beside ours that opens up into ours so that angelic beings and horses apparently can move uh, between universes. I'll pause for any comments. Well, it, yeah, isn't that true that the angelic beings can move between dimensions? Because that's how Satan gets back from heaven to earth. You know, he just he can he can go back now, but when when he falls, when and then as Christ said it before, I saw Satan fall from light uh, from heaven as lightning. You know, then mm -hmm. he can't. Then he's stuck on earth for the seven years. Yeah. Well, not not just that, but but every instance in the Bible where it talks about angelic beings coming as messengers to to human beings. I mean, clearly they step into. Uh, uh, or God allows that dimensional uh, shifting between one place and the other for, for whatever purposes he allows uh, that to happen. Mm -hmm. You see these kinds of things happening on sci-fis like that show Fringe. If you've ever seen that, these different people moving in and out of different dimensions and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and some people, when that show was on, were wondering if these were angelic beings or, or not. But uh, science it takes these things and makes it seem like, well, these are feasible scientific possibilities, but they, they just they can't comprehend that, wait, this is all the things the Bible talks about, and so why, why not just understand that it? it's biblical? Exactly. They don't want to believe that, you know. No, he says, it, a third possibility to me, the least convincing one of, uh, in these instances is that such descriptions are merely metaphorical, not to be taken literally. Uh, but Acts 7 and 2 Kings are a narrative, are, uh, 2 Kings 6, are narrative accounts, historical in nature, not apocalyptic or parabolic literature, the text is clear that Stephen and Gehazi, Gehazi saw things actual and physical. This supports the view that heaven is a physical realm. Physical and spiritual are neither opposite nor contradictory. In fact, the Apostle Paul refers to the resurrection uh, body as a spiritual body, 1 Corinthians 15, 44. God is a spirit and angels are spirit beings, but both can, and on the new earth will, live in a physical environment. I think something else it speaks to real quick, especially in the story of Stephen's case, is something you touched on earlier about the soul sleep. Uh, Stephen, Stephen was physically dying at that point. They were killing him. Um, God, you, you see what appears to be the moment of separation from his his soul, from his body, going into the presence of God. This is a direct, he's not going to sleep. It was as if God was, his fate was decided at that point. He was going to die. And it was as if, it was as if, and I love that story in scripture. I always have a hard time getting through it because I get choked up every single time I read the, the, the account of Stephen. I, it, it just chokes me up. Um, but when he, you know, it, it's decided he's perishing. And he, you, you, you see it as, I always saw it as it was the transition of him dying and going into the presence of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting point too. And 
Um, Stephen uh, is not the only one. Uh, I mean, in scripture, I, I can't think of other examples off the top of my head, but I've heard many examples of people in life uh, as they're dying seeing things. Mm -hmm. They're transitioning into into death, and they see things that they couldn't see before. Mm -hmm. I always question that though, because I know that a lot of people, you know, that's a big prosperity uh, selling point. You know, I went to hell or I went to heaven, and you know, if, as long as they don't have like a story or a string attached, like hey, buy my book or something like that, then yeah, I might I might accept their view. But as soon as they bring out like, oh, just buy my book on oh, I went to heaven, or they give an interview or something, I see them on CNN, you know, automatically it's like ah, I just got another scammer. Yeah, but I, I think it, it's always wise to kind of not take everything at base value and kind of like look into it. I think that's a wise decision. Well, I, I'm referring in, in my example, I was referring to people who actually died. Right. They, they didn't just have a vision and then write a book about it. They died. They're gone. Right. Yeah. As, it, it, as they're dying, they make these dying declarations that they see an angel come to them or something. Well, in, in actuality, I, I actually had a, an instance like that for someone in, in my family. Um, my uncle, uh, right before he passed away, they say some people, um, uh, he was basically, he had gotten to the point where he didn't recognize anyone anymore. He didn't know who people were. He would call me by a different name. He would, um, it was pretty bad towards the end when he got sick. And um, the day he died, um, he had what they called a moment of clarity. And he suddenly spoke to his son as if everything was fine, and he told him that he was going home, and that was it. And then he passed away that that day. And um, it was it was very you know to my family they couldn't you know to me I look back at that now I say sure absolutely because <laughs> it's because of my faith I know that absolutely that could have been the case it was for whatever reason he was allowed that time, and um, I mean because if you'd have seen him if you'd have known him. Uh, it was clearly, uh, it, it was clearly a, an amazing event because he didn't he didn't even realize he didn't know his own sons and his own wife anymore. He didn't really he would call them by different names. So it was it was it was pretty. But as you said, it was his moment to pass away. He passed away that that day. Mm -hmm. Now, if someone uh, tells us of some experience like this and they didn't die and they write a book or something about it, then obviously. We must carefully uh, scrutinize everything they say and test it by the scriptures. Uh, if it doesn't, if it contradicts the scriptures, then then I'd have to reject it, either either complete, probably completely, um, because that that's where I I test things to, for for my truth. I go to the scriptures for the truth, and the uh, I think that's what we're told to do: uh, test it, test everything by the scriptures. No, I meant to that. I mean, that's the biggest selling point why Final Call gained so much publicity is because he sold it on the fact that uh, when he passed uh, due to his, I still think the story's even bogus, but he even, that's how he made his mystery is, that, oh, I died and went to hell because of a heart attack, you know, and then he made his super absolute perfection lordship, the biggest, strongest perfectionist on YouTube gospel. Yeah, even denying that scripture is true. Yeah, he said the Bible. Uh, I saw the people eating the Bible. There was poison, and you know he's a bo he's a phony baloney. I mean, anybody. Yeah, that's why I would ask. The, yeah, phony baloney's being very polite about it, but I would like to ask. I would ask Eric, was this guy you knew like a grace believer and everything? Oh, who my my uncle? He was my uncle, yeah. the the who passed away. Yeah. Um. Well, well, remember this wasn't a thing where where he died and came back supposedly and and yeah. told everybody a story. This was he okay, he, he died. I mean, he, he actually no no no. That's so that's why I made sure I said that he passed away yeah. that day. He was he he had this moment where he recognized his son, knew exactly who he was, talked to him for a short period of time, and he passed away. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, you know what I at that point in my life I was very young and I wasn't even saved at that point. I don't know how my what my uncle's views were. I, I don't I don't know. I honestly don't know, um, but I but I agree. You know, something Austin you were talking about, and I think it is something people do need to be careful when you see these stories coming out and they clearly fly in the face of scripture. Well, then I think you need to kind of you kind of treat them 
with kid gloves. You got to kind of say, well, you know, take a step back and say, well, okay, I see where you're. I see you're trying to inspire. You're trying to do certain things, but you know, the road. Yeah, you know, the road they say of perdition is paved with good intentions. So if people can try to come up with these things, it's not necessarily the right thing. So it is. It, there's both sides of that. There are. I think like, what Luke's talking about. There are other stories scripturally where people were seem to have these situations dying, or somebody has. Um, some type of situation as they're passing away. I, I, I agree with them, but I do think you need. I do think, as you both said, also you do need to be cautious. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you have to. You have to realize too. We're doing this. We're approaching this subject in a very healthy way. Meaning, we're reading a book that somebody's written. He's not claiming some miraculous vision or something like that. We're reading a book what he's written. We're seeing the scripture he uses, and we're discussing it. And we made sure this guy at least understands salvation and everything. Mm -hmm. Right. That's the solid approach that I think we're taking right now that I would encourage everyone out there to approach others, all studies, but especially this subject with, you know. Anytime somebody says, I had a heart attack, and now I'm going to tell you how you can be saved by your good works, <laughs> I think you should run the other direction. <laughs> mm -hmm. Amen. Okay. I like that. I thought that was an actual verse. Or the road to perdition is paved with good intentions. That's a good. I like that. It's a good. Uh, proverb. It's a saying. I don't think it's a verse. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's a proverb or not. I'm, I I don't think so. Well, I think I think it's just it a says, saying. It's a proverb <laughs> of aphorism. Yeah. I like that though. It's it it's, it rings. It sounds justice. Okay. Uh, he goes on to say, uh, if a blind man momentarily gained his sight and described an actual tree that he saw, other blind people, especially if they uh, lived in a world where uh, everyone was blind, might automatically assume the tree was non-literal, a mere symbol of some spiritual reality. But they would be wrong. Likewise, we should not assume that the Bible describes heaven in physical ways merely to accommodate us. It is fully possible that the present heaven is a physical realm. Because the question of the physical nature of the intermediate heaven is important and controversial, we'll take a closer look at it in the next chapter. So, yeah, it's a... Uh, what do you think the, uh, the, the way the world... First of all, we're not even talking about the eternal state, the new heavens, the new earth, where we'll be in eternity. We're talking about this temporary, intermediate heaven state. But regardless of either of those, the world as a whole, for them to think of it as being physical, is just would be a very uncommon... I mean, if you just took a poll and asked people of all religions and uh, every, everybody except uh, an atheist who doesn't believe in any... Uh, uh, um, anything except the physical, they they would all have a really uh, be very skeptical that there's some physical thing. They would think it's a spiritual existence. Maybe just having a deck out with. Is that is that Mitch making that barking sound? <laughs> you know, you know, Luke. It's funny what you were saying because. I, you look at the world. I mean, you look at all the videos on YouTube. Just forget, forget our group that that's coming across, you know, coming to this these conclusions from a biblical perspective, purely trying to you know share the word of God and show God's view on these on these things. But if you just look at if just just take YouTube. And you look at the number of videos out there of um, supernatural things that, that aren't aren't correct that are but but there's a general desire you see I think in people to believe something beyond they they want to believe something beyond and the question is you know it's like question is what is that well, what do you want to believe is beyond what are you looking to for your guidance and that becomes a big part of the of the equation you know where you go to to get guidance about what you know. so, so I think there is I think there is this I don't know. I think there is this big push out there. You just have to watch. There's a lot of videos out there about people with this. And I mean, granted, they're they're all wrong and way off base and some kind of little funny in the head, in my opinion. But I mean, but still, there's this general feeling that they want to believe there's something beyond that because I think it generally presents a less scary outcome for some people. Well, my question uh, and the question we're going to go into more deeply next time uh, is. Uh, is this intermediate heaven a physical reality 
or is the intermediate temporary heaven some kind of uh, just um, spiritual existence with no physical world at all? Uh, and uh, you th what do you think the perception of the world is? Before we go into a, a real thorough study on that, what do you think the initially what the perception of the world would see this as? A physical or a totally spiritual uh, realm? Oh, I'm sorry, Berluk, could you repeat the question? Well, that was like a five-minute question I just asked. I would say, <laughs> to simplify it, maybe, maybe this will... Was Maybe I this gone will help. Did... <laughs> no, you were on. You were on. Okay. Now I think maybe this will clear for Austin. Um, trying to trying to sum up your your question with the answer. I think the world, the way the world sees things, I think that they would tend to believe it's a spiritual thing. Well, but, but not a physical other, thing. The other thing is, it's very important here to explain what a spiritual realm really is. Is that, by definition, something that excludes matter? And if it does, doesn't it, it talks about God seeing things on earth and doing things and stuff. I don't think it's going to be like a bunch of, but when you say spiritual, I think that we need to be clear, we need to really investigate what spiritual means. I don't think it's like a bunch of numbers floating around and you're, you're only a brain because you've lost use of your body, like, like the sci-fi inf infinity kind of thing. And you're just running, running around, and that you know, like ev everything looks like the missing no thing in Pokemon. If anyone gets that <laughs> reference, well, let me rephrase it then. Uh, now we know we've already alluded to the fact that uh, in eternity we're going to have a, uh, a heaven and earth united together, the new heavens and new earth, and it's going to be a physical existence. And we know that we're going to have glorified physical bodies. Uh, but now we're talking about this temporary, intermediate, heavenly state. Uh, the question is, does it have any physical aspect to it, or is it completely non-physical? That's what we're going to go into more detail, but my question is not about whether there is or is not. My question is, how do you think the world sees it as a whole right now? I don't know that the world is really looking at it, but I really think that... I really think that those who do look at it look at it existentially. I think that it's it's hard to answer that question, Luke, because so few people even think that far about it. If that makes sense. Yeah, they're you know. I, I think that's what, I think that's kind of what Mitch was just For saying. Example, I think yeah. people don't even get to that point where they really they're they're not even really thinking about it right now. They don't even. Exactly. It's like it's not important to them. I've never really thought about what your house looks like other than the room you're in right now. I've never really pondered. I wonder what Luke's house looks like <laughs> and everything. You, I think that's what it's kind of like for the world with, with heaven because they're, they're, not, they're not thinking about anything. Well, about they, this. they may not be spending much time thinking about it, but I think the, the world as a whole, and, and, and if I were going to narrow this down, just to professing Christians, for, for example. Professing mm -hmm. Christians whether their form of Christianity is biblical or non-biblical or whatever it is, they're professing Christians and, and they believe that there is some afterlife and this heaven existence. Uh, I would say that most of them think that you're just some kind of like a ghost-like angelic being without a body and existing off in space with, with no uh, material uh, existence. That's what I think that the, the, the church as a whole, who's never really studied this and learned about it, what the Bible says, I think that would be their general perception. Yeah, I agree. Okay, uh, let me ask everybody then to, to make a, a little closing remark on what everything we've covered today, and then we'll, next time we'll go in, into great detail and discuss is this intermediate state has, has a physical aspect to it or not? Okay, but for now, let's just quickly review and, and make any final comments on uh, this, what was discussed today. And let's let's start with uh, Brother Jackson. Um, I would like to say that uh, every time we do this study, it's just more and more and more. I'm realizing how few people have even thought about the subject we're talking about right now, and. 
I think that what this is really the part about this different realms and the um and, and whether it's spiritual or whether there's a physical aspect or something is really lingering in my mind right now, and yet I don't feel like I have a conclusion right now just to say that I definitively know about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think what uh, by us discussing all what we've done up to this point, uh, it also. Uh, clarifies the fact that that so few people spend much time thinking about heaven and trying to understand it, and that's sad because I'll that's tell you what. That's why it's hard to answer some of your questions and some of the questions we have. That's why it's hard because yeah. people don't think about it enough to even ask that usually. Uh, I I remember that when I first read this book, uh, Heaven by Randy Alcorn, uh, five, six, seven years ago, whatever it was, I uh, after I read the book. I probably felt like happier than I've ever felt before, um, and, and I'm hoping that as we go through this study on heaven, that that's going to be the effect on a lot of people that they'll be really, really excited about their future. And all these questions are not only interesting, but I think they are important to to think about and understand because it gives it, it'll give us joy and anticipation for our future. How about Brother Mitch? Yeah, what, what closing remarks on on today's show? Well, heaven itself, in my mind, is 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 a, a place that's just like earth, but just not sinful, not fallen, not broken, no struggles between men, harmony, peace. Give me all those things, provision where we never have to worry about money, but we do celebrate and 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 work with our hands. I believe we'll work with our hands. In such a way that we'll we will always have energy. I mean, just give me those things, and 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 that's enough of a picture for me. So, but but I do believe that that, that heaven is a a place where you can touch, as Jesus ate fish with the disciples. You know, a place where you can eat and enjoy, and there will be great celebration up there. Mm -hmm. Well, um, th this book is so comprehensive. The, the, the points you brought up are discussed later on in the book, like will we be doing work with our hands and what will we be doing and, and, and will we be eating fish or anything else. All these things are in future studies. We'll be discussing all these things that sometimes people maybe thought about privately. Maybe they never had an open conversation as we are doing now, but I think a lot of people have wondered about certain things like, hey, I love my cat. I hope my cat goes to heaven too, you know. So well, there's a lot of questions that we're going to be uh, going through, and uh, I think it, the, there are biblical answers for these. Well, I think that there's going to be more varieties of fruits and vegetables. I think there's going to be new flavors of ice cream, bubble gum. There'll be there'll be all different stuff up there that we've he he, he only showed us a part of it. I think that there's a lot more up there. I really do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can't. Okay. Wait. How about brother brother Austin? Uh, any final remarks on the show today? Yeah, it was great. You know, we always learn something new every day and get the truth. Uh, yeah, it's a wonderful study. You know, people really need to embrace this. It's a, you know, it's a really important thing, and we'll be there forever. So I wouldn't you want to know about more. Mm -hmm. uh, I did have, uh, I did have one thing. Uh, I was reading through uh, Galatians the other day, and I just saw this verse, and this is you know, on topic. You know, for <clears throat> salvation or anything. And it's, uh, Galatians two sixteen, and it man, it really sums it up clearly by faith alone. It says. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So, man, isn't that a wonderful faith alone verse? But, yeah. Uh, yeah, Brother Luke, this is a wonderful study, and I'm, uh, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, very good. I'm glad you said that verse. So anybody who's watching this video now, that verse kind of sums it all up. Uh, you can't go to heaven because of all the good work you've done in your life, all the good things. Forget that. Reject that as an idea, as a possibility. And understand that there's only one way to get to heaven, and that's through faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, don't put your faith in yourself and your own ability. Understand you're helpless, you're hopeless, you need the Savior. There's only one Savior. It's Jesus Christ. He's God who became a man. He died for our sins. 
Sin is not a barrier between man and God any longer because Jesus paid for our sins. He raised himself from the dead. He proved he has power over life and death. He will give you eternal life as a free gift, but there's only one way to get it. You've got to put your faith completely in him, and he'll do it. Now, how about Brother Eric? Uh, final remarks? Yeah, I wanted to go back and kind of build a little bit on uh, what Mitch had said. I, th I think what he said was great. Um, and one of the things that, that I think that we – we fall so short on and have in Christianity is bringing people an idea of heaven that is tangible, that's physical. This is something you're going to enjoy. It's something I told my son. I told him, I said, you know, Dan, you know how when you uh, have a good meal here, you have a, a, a good meal or experience friendship or you uh, play a game or you do these things. It's like, do you know everything you do here because of sin, it's limited. It can only be so good. It can't really be as good as it was meant to be. But when you go to heaven, heaven is going to be the things good the way they were meant to be and, and beyond that. Um, and I can't help but think that when you, when you look at the unbelieving world, you know, is this a, a – we, we talk a lot about work salvation and we talk about that, but is this a bigger problem? I mean, is this a bigger problem that Christianity has caused with the unbeliever to not cover heaven or to make heaven a subject that's almost taboo or not, not make it tangible so that you don't give these people something very realistic to think about and hope for? Is that part of the problem? Is that maybe why some people aren't coming to salvation? Maybe if we do that and we make something – we make heaven into what it actually is and make them hope for this thing that is tangible, it will cause more people to say, hey, I desire that. I want that. That is what I want. Amen. Amen. Okay, I'm coming right now. Uh, yeah, I, I, that's how I got saved. I, I, I got saved because of my love for Jesus and my uh, uh, love of wanting to have eternal life in heaven, not because of fear of hell. So you're right. Maybe this topic will draw people to Jesus and because of their desire for this wonderful heaven we have in store for us. Um, okay, uh, I thank you, everybody. I'm going to leave this open so you can talk, uh, but I gotta, I'm got i going to have to leave to go to my sister's birthday party. But for anybody who's watching this, thank you for watching. I want to thank all the panelists for participating, and we'll end the live broadcast now.